As part of this year's fundraiser for Donors Choose, I offered as an incentive, if we reached a certain financial goal, that I would do a reenactment of the famous debates between Albert Einstein and Niels Bohr over quantum mechanics using puppets. Um, you would be surprised at how hard it is to find a puppet that looks like Niels Bohr. Uh, maybe you wouldn't be surprised by that. But anyway, that was a, a significant obstacle toward, toward getting this done. Then it occurred to me that since I have written a book explaining quantum mechanics through conversations with my dog, I figured, why not use dog puppets to, to represent Bohr and Einstein? So, for the purposes of this puppet show, the role of Einstein will be played by this little Bichon puppet here. And the role of Niels Bohr will be played by this black lab puppet here. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Why do you use these inferior dogs? Why does the Bichon get to be Einstein? Well, the Bichon sort of has that spiky, fuzzy, white hair look that you associate with Einstein. Yeah, why does a black lab get to be Bohr? Well, Bohr is a black lab because I need two dogs that are easy to tell apart, so I got a black one and a white one. Well, why don't you just use me? I can't use you because if I had a puppet that looked like you, or two puppets that looked like you, nobody would be able to tell them apart. But don't I get to be in this? Well, you are in it now. Now you're interrupting me. Oh, sorry. Go on. The 1927 Solvay Conference brought together many of the greatest minds in the history of physics. And it was before this audience of great physicists that Einstein and Bohr had the first of their many arguments about the philosophical implications of quantum mechanics. Einstein spoke first, posing a problem for the current understanding of the quantum theory. So, imagine if we have an electron source. If we take this electron source and send it at a small screen with a slit in it, on the far side of the screen we will see a diffraction pattern consisting of bright and dark stripes. If we detect the electrons one at a time, we will see that each electron is detected at a single spot on the screen, but all of the electrons together group together so as to form the diffraction pattern. Then I see this one electron arrive here, it is then out of the question that it simultaneously arrives there. But the wave, the Schrodinger wave, interpreted as given the probability for this particle to be situated at a certain place, the wave covers the entire screen and not just one point on it. This interpretation presupposes a very particular mechanism of action at a distance to prevent the wave from acting at more than one place on the screen. Einstein's objection is essentially that the quantum wave function describing a particle is something that extends over a large range of space, but when an individual electron is detected, something instantaneously happens to collapse that wave function down to a single point for the detection of a specific electron. This would seem to require something to happen faster than the speed of light, and that would go against the tenets of Einstein's theory of relativity. When it was his turn to answer, Bohr interpreted Einstein's objection as an objection to the recently discovered Heisenberg uncertainty principle, and explained in many more words than were strictly necessary the a means of interpreting the experiment in terms of trying to measure the position of the electron as it passes through the slit, and also measure the wave pattern that it generates on the screen. In Bohr's rendering of Einstein's thought experiment, you would know the position of the particle because it passed through the slit, you could record the momentum of the particle at the same time by mounting the slit on some sort of roller apparatus that would allow it to slide back and forth. By measuring the recoil of the slit after it deflected the electron, you would know how much it had changed the electron's momentum. However, the same recoil that allows you to determine the momentum will introduce uncertainty that wipes out the diffraction pattern. When the electron is deflected slightly upward, the slit recoils downward and then is in a different position for the next electron that comes through, which will produce a different diffraction pattern. Subsequent electron may be deflected downward, causing the slit to recoil upward, and again producing yet another pattern from which the electron will determine its position. The combination of all these diffraction patterns 
acts to smear out any sign of diffraction and prevents you from seeing a wave-like behavior of the electron at the same time that you're measuring both its particle and position and particle momentum. While it's not actually a response to the ob real objection Einstein was raising, Bohr's argument is a very powerful defense of uncertainty and the idea of complementarity that you can only see particle or wave behavior, never both, and most physicists attending the meeting were very impressed. Paul Ehrenfest recalled it. It was like a chess match. Wait, wait a minute. Ehrenfest is a hedgehog? Well, yeah, he was sort of shortish and roundish and had kind of a bristly mustache, so it seems kind of appropriate. Uh, that's kind of weird. Look, I only have so many puppets, okay? All right. Einstein always ready with new arguments. Bohr always producing out of a cloud of philosophical smoke the tools for destroying one example after another. Einstein like a jack-in-the-box every morning jumping out afresh. Oh, it was priceless. Other scientists attending the meeting, such as the British physicist Paul Dirac, were less impressed with the whole affair. I listened to their arguments but did not join in them, essentially because I was not very much interested. I was more interested in getting the correct equations. And of course, Bohr's famously opaque style of speaking and writing didn't do anything to help matters. In particular, it must be very clear that the unambiguous use of spatiotemporal concepts in the description of atomic phenomena must be limited to the registration of observations which refer to images on a photographic lens or to analogous practically irreversible effects of amplification, such as the formation of a drop of water around an ion in a dark room. Once again, the awful bore incantation terminology. Impossible for anyone to summarize. At the sixth Solvay conference in 1930, the world's physicists gathered again to talk about quantum mechanics, and Einstein came up with an entirely new thought experiment. A new Gesanken experiment. Suppose we have a box containing a certain amount of radiation, and inside the box is a shutter which is opened by means of a clockwork within the box. At a certain time, the clockwork op will open the shutter, for a very short time, allowing only one light quantum to escape, then it will close the shutter again. We then allow the light quantum to travel to a sufficiently large distance so as to ensure space-like separation when we make our measurement, and then we can either determine the position of the light quantum by looking at the clock, or we can determine the color of the light quantum by weighing the box and determining how much the energy has changed. For his part, Bohr once again interpreted this as a challenge to the uncertainty principle. So we weigh the box and thus determine the energy content of the photon, and from the clock we know the time that the photon was emitted. Therefore, we know both the energy of the photon and the time of emission, contrary to the uncertainty principle. It was a real shock for Bohr. Wait, wait a minute. I thought the hedgehog was Paul Ehrenfest, not Leon Rosenfeld. No, no, this is a completely different hedgehog. You can tell because it's wearing a hat. That's ridiculous. Look, just roll with it, will you? It was a real shock for Bohr, who, at first, could not think of a solution. For the entire evening, he was extremely agitated, and he continued passing from one scientist to another, seeking to persuade them that it could not be the case. That would have been the end of physics if Einstein were right. I will never forget the image of the two antagonists as they left the club. Einstein with his tall and commanding figure, who walked along tranquilly, and Bohr, who trotted along beside him, full of excitement. The morning after saw the triumph of Bohr. Bohr's triumph came in the form of an explanation of how the apparatus envisioned by Einstein would, in a real system, introduce uncertainty in both the energy of the photon and the position and the time at which the photon was was measured. So we weigh the box by means of hanging it from a spring, but as the weight of the box changes, the elevation of the box also changes. This changes its position in a gravitational field, which causes the clock to run at a different rate, introducing uncertainty in the time, as according to Einstein's theory of general relativity. 
Once again, Bohr's argument is a very powerful defense of uncertainty, but it does not actually address Einstein's real objection, which has to do with the effect of the measurement of, on the box on the state of the photon. Should we assume that the subsequent ve measurement we make on the box physically influences the fleeing light quantum now half a light year distant? That would be superluminal action at a distance. Of course, it is logically possible, but so very repugnant to my physical instinct that I cannot take it seriously. Accordingly, the light quantum has a definite localization and a definite color, and the quantum mechanical description is incomplete. Einstein's attempts to explain his actual objection more clearly were for naught, though, because no one was listening anymore. Everyone assumed that Bohr had won the day, and so Einstein was forced to find an alternative means of attack. So wait a minute. This whole thing is just Einstein making good points and Bohr answering completely different questions? Uh, pretty much, yeah. Humans are so weird. In 1935, together with, with his assistants Boris Podolsky and Nathan Rosen, Einstein put together a third and final attack on, quant on quantum mechanics in a paper by Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen titled, Can Quantum Mechanical Description of Reality Be Considered Complete? As is usually the case with papers whose title is a question, the answer to the question is no. Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen's paper began by putting forth a definition for physical reality and what they call elements of physical reality associated with measurable quantities. In their description, they assume that these elements are local, that is, that measurements made on one system cannot possibly affect measurements made on another part of the system at a different location. Their definition of elements of physical reality goes as follows. If this ought in any way disturbing a system, we can predict with certainty the value of a physical quantity, then there exists an element of physical reality corresponding to this physical quantity. Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen imagine a situation in which two objects are brought together and interact in some way so that their momentum, given the symbol P, becomes correlated with their positions, given the symbol Q. The two objects are then separated by a large distance. After some time, a measurement made at one location by one of the experimenters will instantaneously and absolutely determine the value of the same properties at the location of the other experimenter quite some distance away. The only way for a measurement at one location to influence the outcome of a measurement at another location, according to Einstein and Podolsky and Rosen, would be for some sort of spooky action at a distance, some mysterious additional force to communicate the results of one measurement to the location of the other measurement at a speed much greater than the speed of light. This, obviously, is very distasteful to Einstein, as is the other possibility, the one suggested by orthodox quantum mechanics, which is that the system is simply non-local and that the measurements at one place affect measurements at the other place because the properties of the particles are undefined until the moment that they are measured. The Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen paper made quite a stir and was greeted with some derision by defenders of orthodox quantum theory such as Wolfgang Pauli. Einstein has once again expressed himself publicly on quantum mechanics. As is well known, this is a catastrophe every time it happens. Wait a minute, Wolfgang Pauli is a gargoyle? Why is it gargoyle? Well, did you listen to what he said about Einstein? It didn't sound all that bad. No, but he went on to say this. I will grant him that if a student in the early semesters had made such objections to me, I would have regarded him as very intelligent and hopeful. Okay, you're right. Wolfgang Pauli is a gargoyle. Bohr scrambled to produce a response to the Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen pa paper and hastily prepared a paper of his own. However, this paper, when it arrived, was fairly incomprehensible, even by the standards of, of Bohr's rather opaque writing. Even at the last final critical stage of the measurement procedure, there is essentially the question of an influence on the very conditions which define the possible types of predictions regarding the future behavior of the system. Since these conditions constitute an inherent element of description, of any phenomenon to which the term physical reality can be properly attached, we see that 
the argumentation of Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen does not justify their conclusion that the quantum mechanical description of reality is essentially incomplete. On the contrary, the quantum mechanical description may be characterized as a rational utilization of all possibilities of unambiguous interpretation of measurement compatible with the finite and uncontrollable interaction between the objects and the measuring instruments of quantum theory. At school, I was always taught not to start a sentence until I knew how to finish it. After the Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen paper and Bohr's unsatisfying response to it, physics remained at an impasse for the more or less the next 30 years. Neither side could really convince the other of the validity of their view, and the sort of non-local interactions suggested by Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen remained a major problem for people studying the foundations of quantum mechanics for the next 30 years, until the Irish physicist John Bell arrived on the scene and came up with a way that would unambiguously distinguish between the orthodox quantum theory proposed by Bohr and the sort of local hidden variable theory put forth by Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen. However, discussion of Bell's inequalities and the experiments done in the 1970s and 80s that, that determined unambiguously that Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen were wrong and Bohr was correct, those experiments and the theory behind them are beyond the scope of this puppet show. So wait, that's it? You're just going to stop? Well, yeah. I mean, all I promised to do was to do a puppet show about the Einstein and Bohr debates, and this is the end of Einstein and Bohr's part of the whole thing. Yeah, but you just kind of left the whole story hanging. I mean, nobody gets to hear the end. Well, it's true, but this has already gone on for more than 15 minutes. And anyway, all of this stuff about the EPR experiments, uh, Bell's inequality, the experiments that show that, that Bohr was right, all of that's explained in the book. Oh, yeah, that's right. We have a book. Hey, humans, buy our book. Okay, that's about enough out of you. Thank you very much to everyone who donated to make this, this thing possible. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed the puppet show, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.